Amen. All right, you're there in Revelation chapter 22. Revelation 22, look at verse 18. It says, For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book. If any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. And if any man shall take away from the words of this book of prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. This is a warning in Revelation at the end of the Bible, warning about people that would take away from the Bible. And today we have a problem. There are so many different Bible versions. There's literally a new one coming out every year, yeah. if not multiple. And it causes such confusion. When we go out and talk to people, they, they don't trust the Bible. They have no confidence in the Bible because they know everybody has something different. And they feel like, well, if, if it's easy enough to change it every year, then all bets are off. If yours is different than mine and you can use yours to say something this one doesn't say, then how is it we can stand on something and know that it's true? Right. And on Sunday evenings, we're preaching through our doctrinal statement here at Steadfast. And the first point is the Bible. Amen. And in that, on our website, if you want to look, it says, We believe that the King James Bible is the perfect Word of God. We believe that it is inspired and preserved. We believe that all other English translations of the Bible are corrupt and are perversions of God's Word. Amen. Go, ahead, go ahead and turn to Proverbs chapter 30. Proverbs chapter 30. I came prepared tonight. I, I hid my water under the pulpit so I'd have to get a guy to get it for me. <laughs> so we believe that the Bible that we have, what we call today the King James Bible, is perfect. It's without error. It's not missing anything. It's understandable. It's comprehensible. And it's written for us today. Yes. Amen. There's nothing extra that we need. We don't need a dictionary or a concordance. Now, mind you, there are some things that may be hard to be understood, but that's where God's Holy Spirit comes in. That's where just a little bit of education for yourself would help you understand what's going on in the Word and how to understand it, how it's written in certain ways. And again, what we read in Revelation, it warns if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life. There are many men and women that have been on translation committees over the past couple hundred years with the intention of taking away from what the Bible says. And today we even have certain versions that are trying to add to what the Bible says. We have gender neutral versions. We have versions that want to intentionally change things that literally make it say the opposite. And we're going to look at some examples of this. So the first point, we believe the King James Bible is the perfect Word of God. You're in Proverbs 30. Look at this. It says every, look at verse 5. It says, every Word of God is pure. He is a shield unto them that put their trust in Him. Add thou not unto His words, lest He reprove thee, and thou be found a liar. Now turn to Deuteronomy chapter 4. Now, many of these translators are liars and reprobates. There are many translators, even from the late 1800s, that were intentionally, they, had, they want to worship Mary, they believe in Darwinism, but yet this is the guy that's going to help you find your way about what the Bible's really saying. And that was in the 1880s. How much more perverse and wicked are the hearts of the translators of today? How many yeah. more lies have they put out there just to deceive people? And most Christians don't even read the Bible. They go to church, they hear the pastor preach for 15 minutes, they buy the book in the bookstore that tells you about the Bible, and they never read it for themselves because they feel that this is too big of a task. This is such a, a big accomplishment just to read through it, and yet this is something that I believe, as every Christian, we are responsible to do. Amen. We should task ourselves and set the goal to read through it at least once a year, if not twice, if not four times. I know, I know a 15-year-old... A uh, guy, he's homeschooled, he, read, he wrote it five times last year, he read the Bible. Five times he read the Bible. And when he told me that, I'm thinking, man, i got to get busy. This guy's put me to shame, you know. And what an awesome preacher this guy will be one day because he continues to put the Word in his heart, but he trusts that this is the Word of God and every word is true. And the Bible tells us that, and we're going to look at some of these points, and we're going to make a comparison. Now, I have a lot of information that I've, I've uh, chosen to omit from this sermon have a lot of information about the heritage of the different scripts from, from Antioch and, and, and 
specific details about how wicked some of these translators are. I want to keep it very simple. I want your trust to be not in what I say about some man. I just want you to understand that you can really trust this and you got to get in it for yourself. So that's my goal tonight. In uh, 2 Samuel 22, it says, As for God, His way is perfect. The word of the Lord is tried. He is a buckler unto all them that trust Him. Now, so He's a shield in Proverbs 30. And that's what it means. He's a shield. He's our defense. That's, that's how we protect ourselves through the word. In 1 Thessalonians 2, it says, For this calls also, thank we God without ceasing, because when we received the word of God, which ye heard of us, ye received it not as the word of men. When you hear about the Bible, you don't say, well, that's just some man's opinion. And mind you, there are places where it is man's opinion. When you have Jehu, or I'm sorry, not Jehu, Elihu, who's talking to Job, and he begins to accuse Job falsely, and he begins to say that I am right and I have great counsel, God tells us later that that guy was wrong. When, when Jesus' parents said, you know, your father and I, when Mary said, your father and I have, have been looking for you, Jesus corrected her. What she said, she truly said, but that's not scripture. Right. The author corrected and said, no, I've been about my father's business. Right. So understanding that, that yes, sometimes the Bible will, will quote somebody that's incorrect. It'll even qu quote liars, but you have to understand in context that the author is always right because he is the author and finisher of our faith. Amen. And the first step to our faith is believing and trusting in the word of God. And it, it goes on, he says, you, you received it not as the word of men, but as it is the truth, the word of God which effectually worketh also in you that believe. Now you're in Deuteronomy chapter 4. Look at verse number 2. He gives the same warning that we've just seen in two other places. Ye shall not add unto the word which I command you, neither shall ye diminish aught from it. That means to take away. Don't add to it, don't take away from it. That ye may keep the commandments of the Lord your God which I command you. Your eyes have seen what the Lord did because of Baal Peor. For all the men that follow Baal Peor, the Lord thy God hath destroyed them from among you. So we see this warning of destruction for those that would corrupt the word, that would lie, the, the false prophets. Now look at verse 23. Deuteronomy 4.23. It says, Take heed unto yourselves, lest ye forget the covenant of the Lord your God. Now this sounds like what we talked about this morning. There are things that God wants us to remember. He does not want us to forget, and it's His Word. He says, which He made with you, and let me back up, lest ye forget the covenant of the Lord your God, which He made with you, and make you a graven image, or the likeness of anything which the Lord thy God hath forbidden thee. For the Lord thy God is a consuming fire, even a jealous God. If you think it's okay to carry a New King James or an NIV, God is extremely jealous over that. If you're really saved and you're flirting with disaster by saying, well, I'll just go see how they say it over there. Maybe I'll get a better understanding. You're, you're literally listening to the, to the false prophets try to deceive you, and God's jealous of that. He wants you to stay true to Him. Just as a husband should be jealous over his wife, God is jealous over us. He owns us. He bought us. And he wants us to under, to know his words. And you think about it. If I wrote a love letter to my wife, she would know it's from me. By my handwriting, by my mannerisms, by my manner of speech. If you tried to forge one and put my name on it, she would know right away. She would know the deception. And that's why these things are spiritually discerned. We should know the voice of the shepherd. We should recognize it because we're searching for it. And if you're not in the Bible then you're not going to recognize when a false verse is read. That's right. If the only time you're in the Bible is when you come to church, you may hear a verse on the radio or see it somewhere else and just think, yeah, I think that's King James. I'm not really sure. But for those that listen to the, listen to the Bible regularly, read the Bible, you're going to recognize it right away. Just this afternoon, <laughs> Brother Yates, he goes to buy a Bible cover. He goes to Walmart, right? He's looking, well, I just want a basic Bible cover. I want something to cover. You know, it's raining out. Maybe he needs a cover. I don't know what he was going for. But the point is, all he could find were these Bible covers with false Bible versions on the outside of it. How wicked would that be? Like, I got the true words. Let's, <laughs> let's just wrap it up in something fake. You know what I mean? And it's sad, but this is the mainstream Christianity of America, which are not Christian at all. They're Christian in name only. They haven't believed the promises because they don't even know what they are. There are many people out there that think they're saved, 
and they're not. Yeah. And that's who we go looking for when we're soul winning because they'll listen to the voice of the shepherd. They're searching, and when they hear it, it's like the light bulb comes on. They get it. It makes sense. They get excited. They get pumped up. You know, and we need to have the same zeal for the Word of God and for defending it. Now, in Deuteronomy 4, look at verse 40. Verse 40, it says, Thou shalt keep therefore His statutes and His commandments, which I command thee this day, that it may go well with thee and with thy children after thee, and that thou mayest prolong thy days upon the earth, which the Lord thy God giveth thee forever. So turn to 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3. So here he's telling us, if we hearken to the voice of the Lord through His Word and we obey what we, we read, it says it will go well with us and we will actually prolong our days on the earth. And, you know, hey, I know we all want to get to heaven as soon as possible, but God has work for us here on the earth. We need to prolong our days. We need to be in the Word of God so that we don't fall into sin or maybe even a sin unto death. Or we don't, you know, I mean, because you think about a smoker. I know somebody that's got lung cancer right now. And they act like it's a surprise, but they've been smoking four packs for probably 40 years. And everybody's all, oh man, yeah, did you hear what happened? I'm thinking, well, duh, come on, it's only a matter of time. I mean, you're yeah. destroying your body. How dare you get surprised? Oh man. And then what? Or then what? Are you going to get mad at God next? Well, God, I've been poisoning my body for all these years. Now I'm ready for that miracle, you know? You know, it's sad, but, but you know, we should not poison our mind with the words from other Bibles. Amen. So to pro prolong our days and life to go well, we need to obey God's Word and stay away from sin. He says that we should keep His commandments. There's twofold to that. One is obey it, and the other is to keep it in here, to remember it, to hold on to it. And if you're not remembering it, it's hard to obey it, you know? In Psalm 119, it says, Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way by taking heed thereto according to thy word? It also says, Thy word have I hid in mine heart, that I might not sin against thee. As a growing Christian, God's word, we hear it, we read it, we memorize it, so that when we come across a path, when we come across something that we have a weakness with, we have the Holy Spirit to bring all things to our remembrance, whatsoever He has said unto us, right? Yeah. Well, whatever He has said unto us is right here. And there's a warning in here for you in particular. There's something that's going to help you get through your struggle, and if you're not reading it, the Holy Spirit can't bring it back to your remembrance. Yeah. So for that to happen, we need to commit it to our heart. And it is true. We know that we can depend it. The next, the next point is that we believe the Bible is inspired and preserved. Inspired and preserved. You're in 2 Timothy. Look at uh, verse, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. It says, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. Now what he's saying here, when he says it's inspired, it's written by God. And he says that it's profitable for us. It's profitable for us to make our doctrine from it. Our doctrine is our set of beliefs. My doctrine might be slightly different than yours, but Lord willing, they're both directly based on what the Bible says. If it is, we're not going to be too far away from each other. It says, for reproof. Reproof is a kind instruction. Correction is more of a firm. Hey, you need to do right. God said not to do that. Hey, God said we should go soul winning. We need to be corrected. But He says, for instruction in righteousness. God wants to point us to living righteously. Now, whenever I'm soul winning and I come across the word righteous, I help people define it by telling them that it means always doing the right thing or to be perfect. Now, who in here is perfect? Just by a show of hands. Wait, just me? <laughs> just kidding. But look at the next verse. He tells us how to obtain perfection. And the perfection that we're ser they're searching for is in our flesh. He saved sinners, right? Of which I'm chief, right? He died for the ungodly. We still do ungodly things. But he says here, the man of God may be perfect so how do we get perfect we search the word of god for righteousness to find out what is right and to try to do that now turn to psalm number 12 psalm 12 so the word of god is inspired in second peter 1 we read this earlier this morning it says we have also a more sure word of prophecy whereunto ye do well remember how it said it will go well with thee in deuteronomy well it says the same thing in the new testament that if we take heed to this more sure word, 
we do well. It says, ye do well that ye take heed as a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. That's what inspiration is. Inspiration is when Moses was afraid to speak and God said, I'm going to put the words in your mouth. It wasn't Moses' words. It was Moses' mouth. It was God's Spirit working through this man that was willing, that had separated himself to do the work of God. You're in Psalm 12. Look at verse number 6. It says, The words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. Then it says, The wicked walk on every side when the vilest men are exalted. Now, so it says that His words will be preserved. And this is very important because you look at the verse after that warns us about the wicked on every side, the vilest men being exalted. This is, what ha this is the result of the false Bible versions. Yeah. Now turn to Psalm 119. Psalm 119. Because of all the false Bible versions, nobody is willing to take a stand on the Bible. And it's funny because when you run into somebody that's an advocate and they're ready to argue and say, well, that Bible's not right, the King James Bible, which, by the way, used to be just called the Holy Bible. It was then called the Authorized Bible in yeah. 1881 and 1884 when you had them creating the Revised Version, which was a Catholic Bible. And, they, they, of course, they took away things and they added things to prop up this Catholic doctrine. So then they began to call it the Authorized Version, which it was authorized by King James. Did King James write the Bible? No. Was he a perfect man? No. And people will try to take shots at King James or whatever, and hey, whatever. It's God's Word that He promised He would pre preserve and He inspired it. And I believe that the Lord probably even blessed and filled some of the, the translators with His Holy Spirit that brought this together. You know, the English language has not always been known as English. There were the Anglos and the Saxons, and you had English, which was English, and things developed over time, and word spellings changed. And even from the 1600s when we have this, the same exact time that we have Shakespeare, you know, all these college professors, they, they can read Shakespeare and understand it, but they'll say, well, surely this one's so antiquated. We don't use any of the words. We don't know what it means. Well, it's God's Spirit that you're lacking. That's why you don't understand what it is. And, you know, so you ever heard that, that uh, are you smarter than a fifth grader or whatever? You know, it makes me think, are you wiser are you wiser than a Bible teacher, a Bible college instructor? Well, if you're saved, you are. Because most of them are not saved. I met one. I was in their house uh, for business and um, met one over in Fort Worth. And just, just the, the things they're talking about and how, they, they're, how excited the, the, the wife is teaching Sunday school and the man was such a coward. And he was an instructor and it's just, it was a shame. It's just like, these are the people of God? No wonder the world doesn't want anything to do with it. You know, the world knows boldness when they see it. And I have no fear that whatever I read out of this Bible, I can trust it, I can stand on it, Amen. and I can Amen. say it unapologetically, this is true and this is right. right. You're in Psalm 119. Look at 97. How do we get smarter than a Bible college instructor? Look at verse 97. Oh, how I love thy law. It is my meditation all the day. Thou, through thy commandments, has made me wiser than mine enemies, for they are ever with me. I have more understanding than all my teachers, for thy testimonies are my meditation. Verse 100, I understand more than the ancients because I keep thy precepts. If you want to be a smarter individual, if you want more wisdom in life, and you want more wisdom, more understanding, obey God's word. Meditate on it every day. Keep it in your heart. Obey what you learn. Now, so we believe that all other English translations of the Bible are corrupt and are perversions of God's Word. Now, one of the first things I'm going to look at is the New King James Bible. The New King James is, is one of the devil's subtle you know, changes, one of these things that they try to say, oh, it's just like it. It's almost the same. There's just no these and thous. It's got you know, easier words to understand, which is not true, by the way. And I'm going to look at a couple verses in particular so turn to Matthew chapter 11. And I want to, before I go into the other versions, I just want to kill the, King, the new King James. This is a wicked book yeah. because intentionally they're trying to put this label to make you think it's just as good as the other. 
You know, new is usually better, right? <laughs> Not in this case. So one of the big things they change is hell. And either the translators were confused or they're intentionally trying to confuse the reader. And there's the, the word hell is not completely omitted from the New King James. It's selectively omitted. And they'll replace it with words that are hard to be understood. You're in Matthew 11, look at verse 23. It says, And thou, Capernaum, which art exalted unto heaven, shalt be brought down to hell. For if the mighty works which had been done in thee had been done in Sodom, it would have remained unto this day. So he's telling them, because of the rejection of the gospel, he says, hey, you guys are going to hell. But that's not what it says in the New King James. It says, we'll be brought down to Hades. To Hades. Now, who can confidently say they know what Hades is? Just out of curiosity. Hades has two meanings. Hades, one, is a Greek mythological god that, deal, that dwells in the underworld. And he's, he doesn't dwell with the rest of the mythological so-called gods. And then the other meaning of it is a place where when you pass, when you die, your soul is taken on a rowboat and you're judged by a three-headed dog. Now, why would the Bible use the word Hades here except to cause confusion? Why would they selectively remove hell? We know what hell... Does anybody doubt what hell is? Do you understand where it says the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever and they have no rest day nor night? Do you understand it is, a, it is like a lake of fire? It's burning and torture and torment and it lasts forever. That's what hell is. We know this. Everybody knows that. However, Hades adds confusion. And I believe it's intentional. Turn to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. The New King James Bible specifically attacks the deity of Jesus Christ the fact that He is part of the Godhead, heaven and hell being everlasting, and it changes the Gospel. And so there are many people that we may know that may be deceived by it. Well, I just don't like that old But There are many reasons to get rid of a New King James. I just want to show you a few, and we're starting off with hell. In Acts chapter 2, I want you to look at verse 31. I'm going to read from the New King James. It says, He, he foreseeing this, spoke concerning the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in Hades, neither did his flesh see corruption. Now why would Jesus' soul go to Hades? <coughs> what is Hades? You see what I'm saying? It's confusing because this is all mythological. Mythology was intentionally written for entertainment by people that were probably high or drunk on something, okay? If you know the history of it. And they were probably reprobates also, God-haters. And here he's saying, well, his soul wasn't left in Hades. We know the Bible says that Jesus went to hell. Hey, what is the second death? The second death, hey, what are the wages of my sin? It's the second death. Death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. So because I've broken God's law, I deserve death and hell. Now, most people have heard the phrase that Jesus died for their sins. But is that the full extent of the punishment I deserve? No. no. What else do I deserve? Hell. hell. I deserve hell. So death and hell both have to be dealt with. Jesus had to conquer them both. Jesus had to go to hell for me so I don't have to go. They've selectively taken this out. And this is actually quoting Psalm 16. And in Psalm 16, this again is another selective change. In the New King James, they use hell and then when they get to Psalm 16, they use the word Sheol. Sheol. What is it? A burning hill of trash in the Hebrew? So rather than saying that the Holy One didn't see corruption, that Jesus didn't go to hell, they want to change it. And what they're trying to do is change the doctrine. Very important. And now a lot of the new churches actually will say, oh, that's, that's blasphemy to say Jesus had to go to hell. Actually, no, it's called the Gospel. Jesus died for my sins and He went to hell for my sins. So I don't have to pay that price. He paid the full price. You think about it. If you run a stop sign out here and they give you a $200 ticket, hey, Joe, I'm going to go pay that ticket for you, buddy. I'll go down to the courthouse and I'm going to give him $100. Did I pay it all? No. no, that's only half. So hell is an important aspect and they selectively change it, both Old and New Testament, because they're attacking Jesus Christ. And again, those are phrases they take out. The Lord Jesus Christ. That's His title. 
He is Lord. He is our God. Amen. His name was Jesus. And being Christ, He's the Messiah. They want to shorten that. They want to take one part or another out of that in almost every instance of it. In Acts chapter 3, flip to the next page, Acts chapter 3, look at verse 26. In the King James it says, Unto you first, God, having raised up His Son, Jesus, sent Him to bless you in turning away every, every one of you from His iniquities. In the New King James it says to you first, God, having raised up His servant, Jesus, whoa, 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 wait a minute. If he, I'm a servant of God, but I'm not in the Godhead. Right? Do you see the difference? Do you yeah. see how now you can make up the doctrine, you can change the doctrine just with one word? And there's other instances of just changing punctuation where you can, you can cause questions. Flip to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter number 1. And they'll argue, you know, because in Mark it does say that Jesus came in the form of a servant. But here it says He was the Son of God. And that's very important. And they change in other places where it says Son of God, they'll change it to Son of Man. Hey, again, that is true, but you're changing the Word of God. You're changing what God had intended for us to understand in context. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, look at verse 21. It says, For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It says, right, listen, it pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. Now, a lot of you in the eyes worlds foolishly went out this afternoon preaching. There's many other things you could have done. You could have stayed home and watched sports. You could have taken a nap. But in the, in the, again, the eyes of the world, the wisdom of the world, that's a foolish thing to go out preaching. And that's how we save them. In the New King James, it says, through the foolishness of the message preached. It literally is saying the Gospel itself is foolishness. And the New King James is not alone on this. Every other perversion does this. The foolishness of the message preached. And what they're trying to say is, preaching the Gospel is full. That's foolishness. What God did for you, how He died for your sins, that's foolishness. That is their message. And their Bible is foolishness. Yeah. It's the fool's Gospel. Yeah. You guys ever heard of that full, the full Gospel? Like there's full Gospel Baptist. What they, they believe you have to speak in tongues and roll around. and They're not saved. They believe you can lose your salvation. Yeah. In the NIV it says, the foolishness of what was preached. Saying, when you preach the Word of God, what comes out of the Bible is foolishness. The NIV is a wicked book. So is the New King James. The ESV says, the folly of what we preach. They're changing it to the content of what's in the Bible, calling that folly and foolishness. It's ridiculous. Now, if I could get a couple, couple men to help me real quick. I've got a handout for everybody. We can pass some of these around. Now, in this handout, first of all, actually, would you hand me one? The first thing I want to be clear about is I do not, I do not advocate for everything that's on this handout. We have a Spurgeon quote on the front. Spurgeon is in hell right now. Spurgeon was a Calvinist. He was not saved. Um, there's a, uh, there's some, some other churches listed on the back. I wanted to get stickers for all these. We just simply didn't have enough time. Now, the content on the inside is golden. The content on the inside shows us a list of all the verses from the different versions that are missing. Man, if you want to set the extras in the back, and feel free to take more of these with you. Okay, you don't just you're not just stuck with one. You can you can take more. Now it gives a list of all the verses omitted. It tells us of the words that are omitted. One in particular, how Christ is taken out of the NIV 20 time, 25 times. Lord is taken out 325 times. God is taken out. 468 times. Hell is taken out 40 times. Heaven is taken out 160 times. Now, what I want to do, is I'm just going to read a few verses in a row. These are the verses that are missing from every other Bible. Matthew 17, 21. Howbeit, this kind goeth not out, but by prayer and fasting. Matthew 18, 11. 
For the Son of Man is come to save that which was lost. Matthew 23, 14. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For ye devour widows' houses, and for a pretense make long prayer. Therefore ye shall receive the greater damnation. Mark 7, 16. If any man have ears to hear, let him hear. Hey, you can't hear if it's not in your Bible when it's been deleted. Mark 9, 44. Where their worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. Hell is not quenched. Listen, it says it again in 46, the same thing. Where their worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. Those verses are deleted from every other Bible. Mark 11, 26. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father which is in heaven forgive your trespasses. Luke 17, 36. Two men shall be in the field, the one shall be taken and the other left. Luke 23, 17, For of a necessity he must release one unto them at the feast. John 5, 4, For an angel went down at a certain season into the pool, and troubled the water. Whosoever then first after the troubling of the water stepped in, was made whole of whatsoever disease he had. In John, John 7, 53, through John 8, 11, many of the Bibles delete it. Some of them just delete it in the footnotes. They put little stars or asterisks or little symbols to say this wasn't really in most manuscripts they'll say the originals didn't contain it which by the way is a major lie if you ever pick one of these up the majority text if you've ever heard this what was called textus receptus is over 5,000 copies that say the same thing and then they'll take 20 or 30 and of those 20 or 30 it really comes down to just a couple that are specifically intentionally different and it's obviously that they've been altered but so that's the difference between the majority text. But they don't tell you that. They just tell you the originals. And you think about it, I have, I have several Bibles. And several of them are on the shelf. I cannot use them anymore. Because I have one, it's a loose leaf edition. You go like this and it just falls apart, right? I've used it too much. That Bible belongs on a shelf until I can find something better to do with it. It's, it doesn't do me any good. So the, the one that, that has the less miles on it is the one that I carry. A lot of these, these, these texts that they refer to are ones that were not used because they knew that they were wrong. But even back in the time of the disciples, in the time after Jesus and the first church members, there were false Bibles already being created. They were already, the devil was already working and having men that belonged to secret societies to reprint the Bible with things missing or changed. And that continues today. Almost all of the translators, you can look back, Westcott and Hort is some of the biggest ones. They worship Mary. They were both in secret societies. Some very strange history there. And again, I don't want to focus on that. I want to focus on the Word of God. Now in Acts 8, verse 37, it says, And Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Now what was the question posed here? He said, here is water. What doth hinder me from being baptized? Why would they take this verse out? When the Catholic Church, who was, was tyrannical, and for the purpose of taxation, they wanted to baptize your baby. And to this day, if you talk to a diehard Catholic, they're more worried about getting their baby baptized than getting their kids or grandkids in church or believing in the Bible. They believe that that's the first step toward their salvation. So if you baptize, if you dunk that baby or you sprinkle that baby with some water, and that's what they don't know their history, is that it was used for, a, for the purpose of taxation by, by, for tyranny and for perversion. And so why would you take that out? Because how can a baby choose to believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? A baby cannot even comprehend that. Right. Salvation is something you have to understand and make the choice for yourself. And of course the devil... Through his Bibles, he wants to change that. Yeah. There's several other, other verses in Acts and Romans. I'm going to stop with those. Go ahead and turn to 1 John chapter 5. This is one of the most important ones. 1 John chapter number 5. As you're turning there in Luke 21, it says, Take heed that ye be not deceived, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ. And the time draweth near, go ye not therefore after them. Where he says that I am Christ, where the warning in the end times, they're going to come up and say, I'm the Christ, I'm the Messiah, I'm the Savior. Every other Bible it says, I am He. Okay, I'm He. I had a lady that checked me out yesterday. She was saying the same thing and she was a liar. She's not a He. right? 
But that's where they change. We're, we're warned that there will be false Christ and antichrist. I am Christ. No, I, I'm He. That's all He's going to say. I'm, I'm He. What a generic thing. But again, they're trying to deceive, especially in the end times. In Revelation 22, we read through this chapter earlier, I, Jesus, have sent My angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David, the bright and morning star. Amen. Jesus Christ is called the bright and morning star. Now, what's the star that comes up in the morning? The sun. Now, we don't worship the sun, obviously. In the Old Testament, He's also called the Son of Righteousness as a picture, right? Well, we know that in, in Isaiah 14, they take that out. They change it. In our Bible, it says, How out there fallen, O Lucifer? So, the one time in the Bible we have the name of the devil, O Lucifer, Every other Bible changed that. Well, they changed. Everyone's a little bit different. The NIV specifically says, "How art thou fallen from heaven, morning star?" So the NIV takes a title that belongs to Jesus Christ and they put it in place for the devil's name, so that you don't know what the devil's name is. So you're confused. You're in First John. Look at chapter. Look at chapter five, verse number five. Who is he that overcometh the world? But he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God. In the other versions it says, and who can win this battle against the world? It's kind of weird. And who can win this battle against the world? Only those who believe that Jesus is the Son of God. At least they got the last part right. Verse 6, in the King James it says, this is He that came by water and blood, even Jesus Christ. Not by water only, but by water and blood. And it is the Spirit that beareth witness, because the Spirit is truth. Now listen to this other version. And Jesus Christ was revealed as God's Son by His baptism in water and by shedding His blood on the cross. Not by water only, but by water and blood. And the Spirit who is truth confirms it with His testimony. Now they're adding confusion. They're making it confusing of what's being said here. Yeah. But here's the kicker, the next verse. And this is one of the most important verses you can take somebody that has the wrong Bible. 1 John 5, 7. For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. Every, and what's the other Bible say? So we have these three witnesses, and that's it. What does that mean? Yeah, so we have these three witnesses. I, what do you mean by that? Yeah. Where is it even going? It takes out the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And just the fact that it calls Jesus Christ the Word in 1 John goes along with what's taught in John 1, in Genesis 1. You can connect a lot of dots with that, but if it's omitted from your Bible, if it's deleted, it makes it very difficult to understand. In verse 8 it says, And there are three that bear witness in the earth, the Spirit and the water, in the blood. And these three agree in one. In the other Bible it says the Spirit, the water, and the blood, and all three agree. Very dumbed down. Very simplified. Now turn to Luke chapter 11. Luke chapter 11. In Luke chapter 4, of course, it takes out every word of God as a phrase that is omitted. It says that, that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. Amen. Now something that I do whenever I get a new Bible, for those of you that can see this, I use a green highlighter. That way if I'm using a yellow for something else, it's not confusing. But I put a thin line under everything that's omitted. I actually spend the time with every new Bible and I'll go through the list of what I know is omitted from the, Old Te from the New Testament. And I underline it. So at a glance, I can help show somebody just how much is taken out. I can literally flip pay. It's only a few pages you have to go and you're going to hit something else that's missing. This is a great tool and a great resource. I recommend doing it with your soul winning Bible. Maybe do it with your daily reading Bible because you're going to come across stuff where you're just like, oh wow, they took that out? And you're reading the whole story in context and you get to a point where it's talking about Him being the Christ and they take that out because they're trying to take away the power of Jesus Christ and the fact that He's God. And Luke 4 is one of my favorites because it talks about get thee behind thee, Satan is taken out. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted. And where it says, Thou art Christ. Again, omitted in all the others. You're in Luke chapter 11. Let's look at verse number 1. And it came to pass that as he was praying in a certain place, 
When he ceased, one of his disciples said unto him, Lord, teach us to pray, as John also taught his disciples. Which, by the way, when we go soul winning, there's nothing wrong with helping somebody word of prayer. Hey, let me help you. Tell God yeah. that you've changed your mind, that you believe these things. Amen. The disciples who had been with Jesus are asking, hey, help us to pray better. Help us to, to get better at praying. And you know this passage. Look, he says, And when he said unto them, When ye pray, say, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. As in heaven, so in earth. Give us day by day our daily bread. And forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone that is indebted to us. And lead us not in tempta into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Now, in the other versions, this is, this is absurd. In verse, in, uh, I think this is the New King James, I'm pretty sure. I'm sorry, I don't have it in my notes. But verse number 2, Luke 11, 2. Read along and listen as I read. Jesus said, This is how you should pray. Father, may your name be kept holy. May your kingdom come soon. Now, what's missing from here? Heaven. Twice. Why would you take heaven out of the prayer when you're talking to Father? Why would you take that out? What's, what's the intention behind that? And it, Look at verse 3. He says, Give us each day the food we need. Verse 4, And forgive us our sins as we forgive those that sinned against us. And don't let us yield to temptation. So they've t what about the evil? Delivering us from evil. That's missing. The fact that God is in heaven and that His kingdom is come from heaven has been omitted. How much different would it be to try to write a sermon when you're dealing with a God that's not in heaven, that has the power to deliver you from evil, that has a kingdom that's coming, that's righteous, and you're going to be in it? Wouldn't your sermon just be weak and watered down? It wouldn't have any power. In fact, you would begin to make references to, hey, your best life now. Yeah. And that's the result of these dumbed-down Bibles. Now, with these... Rather, rather than go through a lot more verses, I want to put this in your hand. And you guys, everybody has a copy. Like I said, we have extra copies. Take some with you. If you need to take three or four, go ahead. If we need to get more, we'll get them. This is a great resource to help you discover what's actually missing from your Bible. And if you will do some homework for me, I promise you God will bless you. If you'll do what I recommend and go home and underline or highlight or put a star, whatever it is, whatever works for you if you write in your Bible. But do this, and do it for yourself. Just flip through. It doesn't take very long, but you're going to need a few minutes alone in God's Word, and God will reward you. He'll bless you with the opportunity to share this information with somebody else. God wants us to be able to trust in His Word. He wants us to know that this is the source for salvation, for righteousness, for how we should live our lives. But when all these things have been changed by the other Bibles, it's really taking the power out of the Christian life. And it's yeah. even keeping people from becoming Christian because they've changed the Gospel. So I want to encourage you with that. Like I said, I had a lot of other information I'd like to give you, but I don't think this is an appropriate place. What I want to do is just let you know that, that you can trust the Bible. Now there are other documentaries. Most of you have probably seen uh, New World Order Bible versions. If you, don't, if you haven't seen it, I'll make you a DVD of it. There are also other ones you can watch for free on YouTube, such as uh, Lamp in the Dark, Tears Among the Wheat, and then uh, Bridge to Babylon. And this is a three-part series. Each one's two or three hours. Now, I don't advocate for everybody that's in it. Some of them are Calvinists. Some of them are guys I don't trust. But the point, it shows you what happens, what happened in the process, not only of making, bringing the Bible to where it is today, but then how the intention of Westcott and Hort, which now today, most people, they, they say that's a straw man. Well, Westcott and Hort, that was in the 1800s. What we use is best based on the Nestle Aland, the 28th edition. It's exactly the same thing. It's a straw man. All it is is somebody else looked at the same notes. It's this, I mean, it's the same result, essentially, you know, minus the Apocrypha. So when they try to straw man, you're, oh, well, that you're, you're talking about something from, no, it's all the same. It's the work of the devil. They're trying to, to take the power out of it. There's another great documentary I remind. It's um, the KJB, The Bible That Changed the World. That's another really great documentary, kind of showing you some of the behind the scenes. And again, that's extra biblical stuff. It is history. It's good to know. And, and you should arm yourself with that. 
But you can start immediately with this list of verses. Go ahead and check it out for yourself. Write them down. Look at the words that are missing. And if you have one of these funny Bibles at home, prove it. I've done it. I've gone side by side with a New King James, with an NIV. I've looked. I'm like, okay, this is accurate. I can trust this. Like I said, I don't, I don't advocate for all the information on the other side, but anything relating to what is omitted from the Bible will absolutely help you. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for the opportunity to have your word and to be able to trust it, to know that it's pure and inspired by your Holy Spirit, to know that it's preserved throughout the ages. Lord, I pray that you would help us all just to get stronger in our faith that you teach us through it and that we need to depend on the Bible. Lord, we love you and we thank you for the freedom you've given us to preach the gospel. And I just pray you'll continue to bless this church with more soul winners. Thank you, Jesus. Amen.